God bless you. While we are in this season of shut in and shut down, I thought it best that we come to you every afternoon at 12 o'clock. And we've got enough film in our archive so that we can bless you with one of the world's greatest preachers. I'm talking about my father, my predecessor, Bishop Tom E. Diamond, uh, by far the best preacher I know. And I've got a chance to now play him for a whole generation who might not have ever heard him preach before. My baby girl brought the suggestion. She said, Dad, I think folk who've never heard granddaddy would love to hear him. And so we figured it out. So every day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 12 noon, you will be able to tune in and check out the best of Bishop Tommy Diamond, uh, some of his best sermons and lectures, uh, just an hour. And I think, better yet, I know you will be blessed. So come now and join us for the best of Bishop Tommy Diamond. Our lecture series, this series is on prayer. In fact, the theme for this lecture is increasing our confidence in praying. If I have confidence that God will answer my prayers, I will pray more often for more things. Are you hearing me? The reason that I'm not praying as much as I ought to pray, how many people does that include? It's not praying as much as you ought to pray. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Amen. That, that's about everybody in here, maybe one or two exceptions. The reason that I'm not praying as often as I should pray is because I don't have confidence in praying. So I just go right on through life facing circumstance that overwhelm me beyond my power or ability to do anything about, but I go ahead and face them without God because I don't have confidence that God will answer my prayer. I may believe that he can, but somewhere between he can and his willingness, I may have doubt that he will. Are you hearing me? So what we want to do is to help us increase our confidence in praying. I want you to turn with me to James, if you please. James, the book of James. You don't have to stand on this section. James chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. If you would turn with me to James chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Life is, is, uh, unpredictable. One moment we're doing fine and the next moment in the same day we are doing as bad as it seems that we can. Life is so unpredictable. But the good news is that as sons of God we do not have to allow circumstances ill and debilitating to determine how we feel. Amen? I have no control over many of the circumstances that confront my life with, with weight and burdens, but I do have control over how they impact me how I react to them, how I feel about the circumstances. Are you hearing me? And that'll make more sense as we go on in our lecture, okay? So I got choices, and it's up to me uh, how circumstances will affect me. That's up to me, amen? All right. Now, let's read James chapter Four, verse 1, 2, and 3. Are you ready? And how does it read? From whence cometh wars and fighting among you? 
Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Now let's let our bucket down here in our first lecture on this prayer series. This is a good place to start because in this text we are told that we don't have because we don't ask. Now he starts by saying, he starts by saying, where does war come from? And where is all this malice and contention that, that appears in the church, in the choir? Huh? In the usher's ministry, in the pews, in your marriage, in your courtship, in your partnerships, on your job. Where is all this malice and anger and fighting and warring? What is at the root of this? What is the root cause of so much conflict among us Christians? And he says, the root cause is that we lust. We, our flesh wants to be satisfied. And so having a mind to satisfy the flesh instead of a mind to satisfy our father, we go after what the flesh wants, not after what the father wants, and it ends up, we end up fighting one another. Now in a marriage, in a marriage, it's always at the root of every marital conflict. Every courtship conflict at the root of it is selfishness. You know, we were taught that we are a spirit. We own a, a soul. We live in a body. And therefore, our lives should be operated in this order, that my spirit should be in charge of my soul, which is in charge of my body and not in the reverse, that my body is influencing my soul to take charge, amen, of my spirit. That's not the way we should operate, but that is the way we do operate, most of us, most of the time. And so, operating from our flesh, we are carnal, saved but carnal, going to heaven but not with as many rewards and blessings as God intended for us to have here and hereafter. We are saved, but we are living like sinners. And if a saved person lives like a sinner, he gets a sinner's reward. Are you hearing me? The pastor is going to preach about that. I want you to hear his sermon today because he has a lot to say about that, how blessed we are and how low we are living beneath the level of our blessing. Are you hearing me? All right, so let's go back. So, he says, where does this war come from? These conflicts on our jobs with our co-workers, where does this come from? It comes from selfishness. It comes from the lust of the flesh that wants to be satisfied. In every marital conflict, somebody is being selfish. If not both, somebody is being selfish. And you know, I can always tell, it doesn't take me long to be in a counseling with a, with a couple to tell, Who's at the cause of this? Who is, who is causing this problem? Because usually when they say, let's go talk to the pastor, the one that doesn't want to go, the one that say, I don't need to go to the pastor. Ain't, I, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. I'm fine. You're the problem. You're the problem. And you don't want to go to the pastor because the pastor's not going to take sides and he's going to flat out tell you when you'll be con controlled by your lust and your selfishness and not by the spirit. Are y'all all right? Because the Bible says when you got wars and strife that's going on on your jobs and your marriage and your relationships and your partnerships, when there's wars and strife going on in the church, that, that people can't sit in the same section because somebody else is sitting over there. Amen? So, so we, we, can't, we can't stay in the same section because I don't like that person. And that's all about selfishness. Are you hearing me? And the way that you end the wall is stop pleasing the flesh and start pleasing the Father. There are two minds in control of us. The mind of our flesh that wants to please our selfishness and the mind of our spirit that wants to please God. 
And that's the mind that I should operate my life out of. Are you hearing me? All right? Now, I've got to keep, keep watch on the time here. All right? Let's go to the next verse, verse 2. Would you read that for me again? Listen, you lust, he said, and have not. You got desires of the flesh, and you still can't have what you want. I want a car. I want a house. I want a husband. I want a wife. You lust, and you still don't have what you want. Amen? And, and he said, you kill even, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you what? Ask not. Ask not. You have not, because you ask not. Now, that's, that's number one. He gives you two reasons why you don't have. Two, well, three. Number one, you don't have, because you're operating from a point of fleshly lust, instead of from a point of wanting to please God. Man, I tell you, if you, if you want to please God, amen, if that's, your, if that's the driving force in your life, it'll end the wars that you will, you will create. You'll stop creating wars. I used to create all kind of wars in my marriage. My poor little wife be, be crying, Lord, what have I done that you would make this burden so hard on me? And man, that used to get down to my heart. That used to get me when she say things like that. That used to make me take stock of myself and say, why, why is your wife agonizing like this you you're the boss but that's not a license to be doing things because it please you and not please God are, are you hearing me so I had to get away from that I stopped causing so many wars in my marriage I haven't ended them all but just for me stopping it just just about wiped out all the wars are, are y'all all right and I hope you hear me, what I'm saying, because I ain't just talking about me. I'm talking about me, but don't, don't look at me. Look at yourself. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Look at yourself now, because you're doing stuff, and you're justifying it. You say, I want this, and you justify it. There's no justification for that. Does God want that? So he said, you have not, because you ask not. And we, I ask you, how many of you are not praying nearly as much as you ought to be praying? And everybody raised their hands, and those who didn't raise their hands should have raised their hands, because we are not praying enough, and that's why we don't have more things from God that God wants us to have, simply because we don't have time to pray. We got time to do everything, but don't have time to pray. God is the most convenient opportunity available to us, and yet we find everything else that we can do, but we can't pray. God is right there with you. You can't go anywhere that God is not with you, and you got an opportunity to talk with him on your way to work, while you get to work, in the toilet, on your way in the car. You can always talk to God. It's so convenient, and yet we find not the time to talk to God. Have not because you ask not. And then the other reason, he says what? Next verse. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. That you may consume it upon your lust. You ask for the right things for the wrong reasons. First, you don't have what you should have because you're not asking for it. And then when you do ask for it, second reason, you ask for it for the wrong reason. And now, now, what's the right reason? The right reason is for me asking God for anything that I need is to bless God with it. Uh, did you get that? Huh? Did you get that? The right reason for me to, listen, if I want my prayers to be heard, I got to have the right motive. And the right motive is that I'm asking this so that I can bless you with it, God. Because if there's something that you really need, it will bless God for you to have it. And if what you are asking for will not bless God for you to have it, you're not going to get it. I, I, Lord, I need this man to be my husband. And God is saying, no, you don't. Because if you get this man, you get further from me. Amen. He's going to take you away from me. And so you don't need this man. And, and the right prayer ought to be, Lord, I need a man that's going to bless you in my life. 
I need a man who's going to become a great priest over me. Amen. I need a man who's going to let me lead him to you and, and then bless you through, through him. And then you get what you're looking for. Are you hearing me? You see, we ask God for things, but we don't have God nowhere in mind as the reason for wanting these things. You said, how many of you ask God for a house? You ever ask God for a house? Raise your hand. You ever ask God for a house? Come on now. You ever ask God for a house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. even the ones who are not raising your hand, you have prayed for a house. There's nothing wrong with praying for a house. You think I'm going to say something negative about you praying for a house. The reason you couldn't get it or you couldn't keep it is because you wanted it for the wrong reason. You never intended to bless God with it. You just wanted a house. Maybe you wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Maybe you just wanted a much more plush and luxurious domicile. But where was God in your motive? So the Lord is telling you, say, listen, I had you an apartment, and I could never spend a night in your apartment. You wouldn't give me a place to stay. Why should I give you a home? Or you asked God for a car, and you didn't get it. And God is saying, you never gave me a ride in the old jalopy. I know if you get you a nice brand new car, you ain't going to let me step my feet in it. And then you're going to say, well, when did I see you wanting to ride in my car and I didn't give it to you? And God say, the least that you have done to the least of these, you've done it also unto me. So I got to understand that when I ask God for something, the motive has got to be I want it to bless you with it, God. Amen. I want this wife, I want this child to bless you with it. Hannah couldn't get her prayers answered. She wanted a child. She couldn't get her prayers answered until she got her motive straight. And then one day, she couldn't take it no more. She went to the temple to start praying. Eli saw her praying. He thought she was drunk. She wasn't drunk. She was overwrought with tears and compassion. And she said to God, if you give me this son, I wean him and I bring him and give him back to you. And Eli told her, said, go home. God has heard your prayers. And Hannah conceived the day she got home and went with her husband. She conceived that boy. And guess who that boy was? Samuel, one of the greatest prophets God ever had. He anointed David, king of Israel. You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you don't ask for the right reasons. You want it to consume it upon your lust. You don't want it to bless the Lord. Let me help you with going to your jobs. And I had a lady that called me the other day. And she said, I, I cannot stand going to my job. She said, I can't, I can't stand it. She said, she said, preacher, when I think about going to work, I have to just fight to not throw up. She said, I'm about to vomit just thinking about the job. Praise his holy name. I said to her, darling, you are letting things control you. You, you shouldn't let circumstances ill yeah. control you. Circumstances shouldn't have you up at night and not able to go to sleep. Circumstances shouldn't have you going to bed in fear. Circumstances, God didn't intend that for you. And so I told her, I said, what you got to do is stop associating bad things with going to work. See, you got the power to, 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 to control how things impact you and how you see things. I say stop associating bad things with the notion or the thought of going to work. I say, isn't there somebody on that job you like? She said, yes, I, li I like so-and-so. I say, well, so-and-so treats you nice, always good to me. I say, well, when you think about that job, think about I'm going to see so-and-so. Yeah. Amen? I say, and do you need the job to keep a roof over your head and food on? She say, yeah. I say, baby, think about when you go into that job. Don't think about all those negative things. Think about this job is putting food on my table and clothes on my back. And you'll go to the job skipping and praising God. God bless you. I've been watching this special presentation from the Abyssinia Missionary Baptist Church. We pray that this message has been a blessing to you. If you're not a member and you want to give your life to Christ, email us at info at abyssinia.org or call us at 904-696-1770 or respond to our Facebook page at Abyssinia Missionary Baptist Church Jacks. 
If you want to make a contribution to the ministry by way of tithes and offerings, go to our website at abyssinia.org and click Online Giving. Select your type of contribution, and it will take you to a secure page to make your transaction. If you want to send in or drop off your contribution, you can do so at 10325 Interstate Center Drive, Jacksonville, Florida, 32218. You can also cash out your contribution to dollar sign the AB 101. Thank you again for watching, and God bless.